welcome everybody. Um, we're glad for those of you that have joined us and um, we're expecting a number of others to join on as we as we move along here and uh, Steve will be faithful to let them in. Um, so I'm Tom Hare with Harvest at Ministries for anyone that doesn't know me and I want to welcome each of you for taking time out of your schedule to be with us today on this Sharpen the Axe Zoom. Our topic today, as we mentioned, is going to be called Church Out of the Box, and what we're looking at are some new methods and uh, new models, perhaps, for new challenges in this post-COVID time. And we have a special guest today with us, Pastor Joe Del Torrio from River of Life Church in Hudson, and they're going to be sharing some of the things that the Lord helped them, um, I don't know, stumble into or <laughs> lead them into. Um, sometimes God guides us directly and sometimes he helps us stumble into things. <clears throat> um, recently, we were in Israel on a Roots of Faith study tour and, and got back just a few weeks ago with the Neptunes and some others. And after that, we went for a little R&R &R down south. And I happened to be at a place where um, <clears throat> Richard Blackaby, the son of Henry Blackaby, was speaking and doing a seminar. And so uh, Rachel and I went to that. and. Um, well, there he said he, he was very concerned about kind of the, the state of the church and uh, and what's going on and so forth. And he shared some, some statistics that are probably familiar with more than a few of you. But And one of the things he said was that in the aftermath of COVID across the nation, um, there's been an approximate loss of 30 plus percent of uh, church membership and, and attendance at at most churches, that's a nationwide average. Of course, there are exceptions here and there, uh, one way or the other. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, and he just uh, sp spoke to that whole issue and the need for us as we're going forward. He said, you know, things are different. And um, his observation was that pastors that were trying to think about how do they kind of go back and recapture what was, uh, that that's really a dead end street and not, not gonna work and, and not be productive in the long run, but that we needed to be looking for the opportunities that God would open up going forward and to be open to what he might wanna to say to us. So we began kind of exploring this in our last Sharp in the Act, and we had a few different pastors share their experiences during this time. Um, and we're kind of continuing in that vein and uh, asking Pastor Joe to share. So he's going to, uh, present for a little bit, and then we're just going to open it up for comment and Q&A and so forth. If you have some questions that you would like to uh, ask um, as we're going along, just use the chat feature and um, just put it out there. And then when we finish Joe's presentation, we'll start to go over some of those things. All right. And um, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Joe Del Torrio as soon as I pray. So Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this day and for each person that's on. And uh, we ask, oh God, that you would actually protect everybody's internet connection so that we have um, good internet and communication on this Zoom call. And uh, Lord, uh, we pray that uh, you will help us to hear the things that each of us needs to hear. We commit this time to you. We pray for Pastor Joe, make his tongue the pen of a ready writer and bless him with uh, your thoughts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Tom. It's good to be with everybody. And uh, we started talking about church out of the box. And this is what I saw when I came in uh, this morning. This is Pastor Jeff's version of church out of the box. There he is editing <laughs> uh, worship for this week. So that's not what we're talking about when we talk about church out of the box, although I like that. He smelled a lot of coconut oil, which is okay. But anyway, uh, let me just start with a couple disclaimers. First of all, what I share today is not necessarily the view of all of HarvestNet. Uh, this is just something that God has been doing in, in us. Uh, I am not trying to sell a package or a model. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're a work in progress. We've made a lot of mistakes and uh, we've learned through um, experience what we can do and can't do, and we're listening very carefully to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I do uh, pray, I think there are principles and 
theological truths that we've learned along the way, and especially in the last three years that I would like to share with you. And I think some of them are non-negotiable because they come from the theological level. Uh, you need to know that finding the new model uh, we are using came through a lot of prayer and also a lot of frustration. Um, I, I have to say that I could not have done this on my own. Uh, we have an amazing team and uh, some of them are on, Jeff, Dion, uh, Leah, uh, just a lot of people uh, that are in our church, so many of our house church leaders and hosts that made it happen. And uh, there we are. So what do we mean when we say church out of the box? I wanna start with a theological picture that from my very first days as a Christian has totally stirred my heart every time I read it. And that's from Acts chapter two. And there in Acts chapter two, we see the power of the Holy Spirit falling. We see tongues of fire that appear uh, over each person. Uh, we see people speaking in a new language. There are 17 nations that are present in that moment, at least that we know about. And they're hearing this new message about the Lord Jesus. Peter gives a pretty clear understanding that this is what Joel spoke about in Joel chapter two that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon all people, young and old, the poor, the rich, uh, people from every station of life. But I wonder if we really have caught what was happening in that moment. It was just moments before that the curtain of the temple uh, was torn and Jesus cried out, uh, it is finished. Uh, you know, the, Jesus on the cross, when he spoke those words, uh, something happened in the spiritual realm. And um uh, between that time of uh, Jesus dying on the cross and uh, this moment of Pentecost, these 50 days, what is being released in the world is so amazing. And the Lord has spoken to me a lot about that particular moment. I think he was saying more than he was just pouring out his spirit. I think he was saying that sacred time and sacred space were over. And it was time to get the church out of the box. I don't want to be disrespectful, but the, the, the presence of God had dwelt primarily his manifest presence in the Holy of Holies. There was a separation between God and man. It was very clear to the first generation Israelis that saw this manifestation of God's spirit that that same Shekinah glory was now resident in a living temple and was uh, power empowering every person uh, that was there on the day of Pentecost. I believe that that was the moment that uh, God's strategy moved from attractional to missional. Instead of going to the temple, instead of going to worship in one place, the Lord was saying, this is to go all the world. It is, it is to go with every person. It is to go to every family, every household, every oikos in the Greek. And uh, I'd encourage you, by the way, if you study in the Greek and look at that, the word oikos and household uh, is also can be translated as house church and you look at that, it's an amazing uh, thing when you look at it in that perspective. But there's a universal priesthood, uh, every man and woman, and uh, they are empowered to bring the power of God everywhere. You can imagine the horror of Satan and his uh, kingdom of darkness, realizing that that same power that had been at work in Jesus is now loosed in every neighborhood and every family, everywhere that uh, Jesus wanted it to go. Isn't that an amazing thing? I just love that picture. So the, the, the thing I want to share today is the early church seemed to preserve that idea, at least for several hundred years, but it was during the time of Constantine that unfortunately we began to put things back in the box. And I'm not going to do a whole unfolding of history here, uh, but I want to say that I believe that when, when the church began to move back towards buildings and recreate a priesthood uh, that was not in the New Testament, and when we began to look at a clergy laity distinction and the ordination of a specified clergy, we moved away from what God released that day in Acts chapter two. And uh, even though the Reformation, 500 years ago, the Protestant Reformation restored a lot of what was lost from those early days, the sola scriptura, the word was restored, uh, the idea that um, we, uh, the salvation by grace through faith was restored. But one thing that was not restored was this idea of a universal priesthood and the power of the spirit moving in every individual. There was still this idea of a strong clergy and a by and large passive laity. And I feel like God again is speaking to us in a new reformation today saying, please look again 
and get this idea. Now, I, I do want to make another disclaimer here. I don't believe everybody should do things the way that we're doing it. But at some point, if we don't get the principle of gathering in small groups, whatever format you use to do that, and make disciples that know how to make other disciples, I think we're going to miss uh, what God has for us. So let me just say, getting out of the box has been a, an adventure for our church. Catalyst was a, uh, or excuse me, COVID was a catalyst, but it was not the reason that we went to house churches. Some people said, oh, you went to house churches because of COVID. No, God had been speaking to us for four years. Three times over 20 years, our church tried to do house churches. We tried different models. I have to be honest with you. We failed miserably the first three times we did it. Uh, I was so discouraged because I knew that house churches or small groups were the, the way that we needed to, to, to use to make disciples, but it didn't seem to be working. But during COVID, what happened, this is the one element that the Lord really impressed on us, was that we needed to make house church our central event. Instead of a meeting on Sunday morning where the whole church came together, we needed to decentralize and meet in houses. And for the first time, house churches took off and became uh, something vital in our, in our community. Did COVID help? Yeah, it probably was a catalyst in helping, but that's not the reason we, we did that. And that's when we uh, came to a place of breakthrough. So we, are, we, we still meet uh, twice a month in large groups. We have what we call a rhythm of gathering. And I'm gonna ask Dion to uh, stream just a one minute video that we use to orient people to what we do. This might give you a better idea of what we're doing. Welcome. River of Life is a growing network of house churches committed to Jesus-style discipleship. If you are new to River of Life, it is important to understand our rhythm of gathering and the heart behind why we've structured meeting together as a church in this way. The first Sunday of the month, we all gather together in our church building for a big celebration service. This service includes a full worship band, message, taking communion together, prayer ministry, and fellowship with everyone that's a part of our church community. The remaining Sundays, we meet in house churches. House churches are more than just a different kind of gathering place. They are our primary place of discipleship, fellowship, and connection. A house church environment allows for greater participation, intergenerational relationships, activation of prayer and spiritual gifts, service projects, and expressions of hospitality and care. House churches are designated primarily geographically with the hope of having neighborhood influence. Those gathering have fellowship, worship, they watch the message that we release online, and then they have an open discussion and prayer time together, encouraging each other to respond to what the Lord is teaching them. Every month, we also have an all-church meal together and an extended time of worship, prayer, and praise at our church building. This takes place on the third Wednesday of every month from 6 to 8 p.m., and everyone is encouraged and welcome to come. In addition to these gatherings, our church continues many other ministries that regularly take place throughout the week. Youth group, young adults, Bible book studies, freedom class, and other discipleship classes are all opportunities to connect even further and to grow in your faith. If you would like more information about any of these gatherings or would like to be invited to a house church, please reach So that gives you a little idea of what the rhythm is of what we do. We felt as we prayed together and I got our leaders together, all of the potential house church leaders and hosts. And I said, uh, if we put the message out, uh, if we streamed it via the internet for the house churches and we put a worship package together for your house church, would that help? I had people say, if you want me to teach, if you want me to preach, I can't do it. But if you provide the message and you provide the worship component, uh, we'll do that. And some of our house churches have their own worship. I was in a house church last Sunday and uh, actually uh, three children, uh, one eight, one 10 and one 12 led worship at the beginning. And then we uh, streamed uh, what Pastor Jeff had put on, but many of our house churches augment and do their own. We give them the freedom to do that. But there's something powerful about all of us going through the word together I know Francis Chan and his church network, they all use the same scripture, but they study separately, but they read that same passage every week. 
I feel like there's something important for our network to track together. We had a moment where I was walking through our building and I said, Lord, you've called us to do house churches. Uh, do you want us to sell the building? And I really felt like the Lord said, lay everything down. Uh, nothing is sacred. And the Lord said, I want you to keep the building, but I want you to change the focus. I want you to be an apostolic uh, sending and training center. I want you to be a ministry center. And I want you to change the focus of how you use the building. And I have to tell you, people say, well, you're in house churches. Are you using your building? We're using it more than ever. And many of our house churches are actually putting together their own things. We have two house churches, three, I think now, the ladies in those house churches are meeting for intercession on Thursday night. They're praying for spiritual awakening and for people that are um, prodigals that have been lost to come back. And it's powerful. But the neat, the neat thing is, is the house church has become a driver for a lot of the vision uh, for new things that are happening. So let me just share a couple key principles. And in, along with that, I'll share stories. And uh, I don't want to go too long. We'll have opportunity for discussion. But the first principle is, I hear people say the church is failing. And Tom alluded to that a little bit ago. If you read the Barna research, um, you know that only 7% of Americans have a biblical worldview, and even many evangelicals uh, don't have a, a biblical worldview. Um, and I want to say the first principle is, I don't believe the church is failing at all. <clears throat> I believe the church is being purified and prepared for a new season in which God wants to do amazing things. Uh, we were warned in scripture about a falling away, about a time of lawlessness, and uh, I think we're experiencing some of that right now. And, and personally, I just want to say, I don't think our, as we've sought the Lord, the prophecies we've been getting, I don't believe that this is the end times. I believe we're in the early season of um, birth pangs, if you want to say that. I think the enemy is trying to push his antichrist agenda. But I think that we need to be very careful not to just give up and dig a hole or move out to the country and hide out from everything. Now is a time to engage because I think God has some of the greatest days for the church uh, like we have never seen before. His true church is coming out. The false church is being exposed. And much of what is happening in the church right now is God at work. The Lord will not tolerate people that are sexually abusing the sheep, that are not teaching the word, uh, that are abusing money. And he is cleaning house. If you understand what's happening, this began in the late 80s with the charismatic movement when the Lord began to expose uh, the hearts of charismatic leaders that were not walking in integrity. Uh, he began before that in the mainline church, and we've been in a season of God shaking the church, but now it's intensifying. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen the evangelical church being shaken, and it's not done. I believe there's a lot more. God is exposing sin and weakness. And in the midst of this, I believe he's trying to get our attention and show us a new agenda. I think Jesus is restoring his ministry the way it was in uh, the Gospels uh, to the church, and uh, he's calling forth a remnant. And I, and I hope you're encouraged. I, I know that it's hard when we see leaders going down and things happening in the church. Uh, number two, the second principle, I believe we're in the midst of a new reformation. People ask, so this house church thing you're doing, is this a church trend or is it God's reformation? I remember uh, it years ago, it was 1989, I heard uh, J. Philip Hogan, who was the leader of uh, Assemblies of God Foreign Missions at that point, he um, made a comment about having to flee China in 1949. He said they left China and there were about a quarter million believers and uh, the missionaries were all saying, what's going to happen to the Chinese church? He said when he went back in the 19, uh, late 1980s, they found al almost 100 million Chinese believers that had been meeting in house churches. It was all organic. It was decentralized. It was not put together by a central committee. They discovered by walking with the Holy Spirit a new way, and they went back to the word of God and lived this organic um, church thing. And you have to admit, if you look at what's happening around the world, some of the greatest moves of God in the 20th century and the early 21st century have been house church movements in highly persecuted countries. Well, folks, get ready, because I think the house church model is going to work well in the United States in one way or another. 
Um, what's happening in Iran right now is another example, and I don't want to take too much time. But what has happened is, in the past, we've done a good job of filling church buildings with attendees. And what we've done is we've created consumers. Barna reports uh, confirm that again and again. What we don't have are people that can stand up and be disciples. And when I say that, I say that as that, that's what we looked at in our church. When we began to go through our transition, we realized, I sat down with our staff and we realized that we spent 70% of our week, 70% of our time, and probably as much money in a less than two hour a week meeting. Uh, we put so much energy into putting on a, sorry, a show. We put on worship, we put on a message, but it was all something that was passive that people listened to. And what we found out, and I had to, I had to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want to admit this, but I have to admit this. What I'm seeing are not disciples. Maybe 15% of our people were disciples, but what I'm seeing are people that love coming and receiving, uh, and they're, they're not producing, they're not becoming those kind of people that are going to change the world. So we need to honestly admit, uh, is what, what we're doing in our church working? And culture has shifted. What, what has happened in the cultural shift is many people that were Christian in name only uh, are falling out, and we're seeing, and we're saying, what is happening? People are falling away. Honestly, I don't think many of those people were committed disciples in the first place. And now that it's become hard to follow Christ, and they really have to count the cost of discipleship, they're stepping away. I don't think God is concerned. I think God is behind this, and I think he's stirring the church for his purpose. Tom referred to the uh, study out of Arizona. Um, this is out of the American Worldview Inventory. Uh, there he says, this is Dr. Len Munsell of, uh, he's the president of Arizona Christian University, shared the research, <clears throat> only four out of 10 pastors have a biblical worldview. So let that sink in for a second there. Four out of 10 pastors have a Christian worldview. If that's true with pastors, that's why only 7% of people in our churches have a Christian worldview. And you can read the rest of the study. It's, it can be disheartening, but it's time to be honest. I'm not anti-education, <clears throat> but I have to ask the question, are we going to continue to train leaders in the ways that, um, that we are training them? Excuse me a second. I need to clear my voice. I think I heard at our last um, HarvestNet meeting, Tom asked the question, is it time to re-engage a local uh, training, uh, leadership training, a seminary? And I say yes, because I believe people learn best in the context of everyday ministry, rather than going to a place where they're totally disconnected from real life. The third principle, we need to change the metrics of our success, or we're going to keep failing. We've heard these church growth things that have happened. Um, over the years, and the church growth things are always, have often been um, focused on how many people are in our Sunday morning uh, meetings. So I need to ask the question, are we going to create a crowd? Or are we going to make disciples? And uh, how many disciples are really doing Jesus uh, ministry out in the world? Um, Everything that we have looked at as success is based on a pray this simple prayer with me theology. And I, I say this, I want to say this with all humility. I believe you can pray a prayer and you can commit your life to Christ. But if you're not growing as a disciple from that point onward, then what happens? Um, I ran into one guy years ago and he said, well, he said, I'm not serious enough to come to your, your fellowship. He said, I'm a carnal Christian. And I said, what do you mean you're a carnal Christian? He said, well, I've accepted Christ, so I know I've got eternal life, but I'm living with my girlfriend and I'm not really where I should be. So you figure that theology out. I want to see disciples that are walking in victory, and that's what I want to count as success. I have to tell you that at now coming into our third year of doing house churches, I am seeing people grow in discipleship like I've never seen it before. And I talked to a friend, Ruth Roybal. Some of you might recognize her name from Cali, Columbia. Uh, during COVID, they all went to house churches. They couldn't meet in a central place. 
Ruth said, Joe, I've seen people that have sat in the church in a pew for years. Now in a house church, they are rising up in their gifts like I've never seen before. They are taking their neighborhoods for Jesus. They are learning to step out in boldness. Now, was that intentionally done? No, but I think by putting the onus of growth and ministry and understanding your gifts in a house church concept, I think that's one of the things that happen because of that. Last Sunday, I was in a house church. I was privileged to see a 12-year-old girl get a word of knowledge for a 60-year-old woman that made this woman cry. And uh, this girl just, I, I said, you have something, don't you? And she just confidently shared that. That's the exciting thing that I'm seeing in house churches that I would never see on a Sunday morning or I would rarely see on a Sunday morning. And our, our children and our teens are part of that intergenerational ministry. We've defined what we say are four hallmarks of a successful house church. And um, Dion, if you could cue that up, just a short video. Our friend Dave Buring did this for us. For us. Go ahead. So this is year 50 for me of following Jesus and 45 in ministry. And over the last number of years, I've been trying to consolidate some things inside my own heart and mind as relates to the church. And when we think about home churches, what does that look like? What does health look like? So the place that I like to jump to following the life of Jesus and the Gospels is the book of Acts. It's the launching of the church. We see real people trying to make the ways of God happen in, in a real small church situation in the homes, which was the norm at the time. And so I begin to just think about what does healthy look like? Because so often we can fall back to, as it's said in pastor world, nickels and noses. How much money is coming in? How many people are there? But that's not the way the kingdom works. Remember, even in Acts itself, when they did the right things, it says, and God added to them those daily that were being saved. God is the one that multiplies. He's the one that adds. So for me, I ran into four things that I saw as kind of the minimals. Like, like what does it mean to actually function as the church to express the kingdom? And so as you read through the book of Acts, you'll note these four things coming up repeatedly. So the first one is presence. Like how can you be the church without God's presence? How can you express the kingdom without God's presence? And all through the book of Acts, we see God's presence. Secondly, we see community. People relating well with one another, laying down their lives for each other, caring about each other, fighting for unity with each other, community. A third one is disciple making. And we see this constant place of them taking the things that Jesus had commanded them and passing them on to the point that people looked more like Jesus. And people then were able to multiply that same thing in the lives of others. So the third one was disciple making. And the fourth one, I'm just using a very broad word, outreach. We could say missions, we could say a number of things, but I'm saying outreach and I want you to think local and global because the church constantly was extending itself. It was expanding, it was multiplying. And so when you look at the book of Acts, it's a whole journey beginning in Jerusalem and now you end up in the uttermost parts of the earth. Presence, community, disciple-making, outreach. Four key hallmarks of what it looks like of a healthy church, a healthy home church. Thank you, Dion. So that's part of a new series that we're putting together to uh, train house church leaders. And uh, we also are going to make those available to churches that uh, would like to uh, use those. You'll notice, I don't think we even have the River of Life logo on that. We made them a little bit more generic, uh, but we want that to be something that people can use if um, it's something that they feel like God is calling their church to. But, um, and, and that's the key, um, is training our leaders. Uh, the fourth thing I want to share, and I'll go through these quickly here, church structure can prohibit or propel God's design for making disciples among the nations. I was taught years ago when I was doing my Bible training in the late 70s, early 80s, 
that uh, Jesus gave us a message, but he never gave us a method. I realize now that that is not true. Jesus did give us a method. He chose 12 people and he poured his life into them. And uh, there was a, a strategy in the early church when the 3,000 people came to the Lord on that uh, day of Pentecost, there were 120 key believers that I think were the core of people that opened their homes and uh, helped disciple those believers. Paul was able to say at the end of Acts, in Acts 20, 20, he said, I've taught you publicly and from house to house, from oikos to oikos. And you get this understanding that that's how the church moved forward. There was this strategy of discipleship. So uh, how can we handle that growth? I think that house church structure can be a powerful engine to do that. Uh, number five, pastors will either be business managers or, or disciple makers. Uh, I have to be honest with you. I know we have business leaders on today as well as pastors. But the things that pastors are asked to do in modern culture, uh, to deal with finances, to create little theater in their church, to do musical development, uh, to arrange social events, to do building management, visitation and care, uh, to teach and preach the word, community relationship events, uh, promotions, putting together promotions piece, piece, children's ministry and youth ministry, putting together teams for that. Uh, these are all good things. There's nothing wrong with those, but there's not one person that can do that without burning out. And we're losing pastors so rapidly uh, in the church because we have an impossible thing. Something happened to me as we started shifting to house churches. And one day, this really kind of shook me up. I realized that we had 50 pastors now. We had all these people in their house church that were doing the spiritual care. I didn't have people calling me on Monday morning saying, uh, would you pray for me? Because they prayed for, they were prayed for in their house church. And um, we told each of our house church leaders they needed to equip other leaders. So we have at least hopefully two couples in each house church and we're trying to multiply more. But they became the pastors of our church. And we went from having a small group of two or three specialists to having a core of pastors that knew how to do spiritual care. And, um, a lot of those other things that pastors do, I found out were more attractional things, trying to get people to my building. I totally had to shift to training leaders that knew how to make disciples. And it's been a joyful thing, even though it's been a, it's been a, a journey along the way. Uh, number six, how will we define salvation? Is it a, is it a one-time prayer or is it a lifestyle of healthy discipleship, walking in the ways of God, bearing fruit in every dimension of our life? We need to uh, change our metrics and how we define salvation. And then the last thing I want to share is, and this is uh, arguably as important as house churches, uh, when Jesus called his disciples together, it says in Mark 3, uh, verse 13, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, and there are three reasons why he appointed them. Number one, that they might be with him. Number two, that he might send them out to preach. And then number three, verse 15, and to have authority to drive out demons. How many of you would say those are uh, the job descriptors for the pastors that you are choosing uh, for your church today? Uh, I, I was reminded 20 years ago, I was in a businessman's uh, Bible study here in Hudson. We were studying, I think it was John 9, where Jesus is dealing with demonic, uh, a man who's demonized. And one of the guys said, I am sure glad we don't have demons today like they had in Jesus' day. And uh, I know they have them in Africa, and I know they have them other places, but they don't have them here. And I have to tell you, I think a lot of people have that strange theology. Folks, people are more demonized than ever before. And if we as the church don't know how to liberate them from the demonic things that hold them captive and how to heal their hearts from the wounds they've received, uh, we are not doing Jesus' ministry. Jesus declared in Luke 4, uh, verse 16 through 20, and of course, verse 18, he picks up, uh, he's quoting Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the, for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I don't think when he's saying oppressed, he means political oppression, although sometimes that happens. 
I think he's talking about spiritual oppression and spiritual freedom. And uh, it was uh, years ago, about 2004, we, uh, I remember saying to myself, I don't want to go to my church anymore. How many of you have ever been a pastor and you said, I don't want to go to my church anymore? <laughs> And uh, we sent my wife Janice away for training in a church in Tacoma, Washington, a Baptist church that was experiencing revival, and they were doing a thing called Jesus Ministry. A guy named Brian Brennan was the youth pastor there, and of course, he went on to uh, lead the circuit riders, and some of you are aware of uh, that whole ministry with YWAM and everything. But um, she came back, and it was the beginning of a whole transformation at our church, and we started learning how to set people free from demonic strongholds. Um, last week in our house church, Joe, excuse me, Joe, about yeah. one minute, one okay. minute last week in our house church, we, uh, did that with each of our house churches. And we asked people, um, to pray original design prayer over people. Uh, we've taught our people how to hear the voice of God, how to get people set free, uh, how to listen to restore God's design that's been lost. And uh, that has been an amazing component of what God is doing in our church. So that's the last thing I would say is, I believe this reformation is restoring Jesus' ministry to the church. Be back to you. All right, great. Well, uh, thank you, Joe. There's lots to unpack there. And uh, I'm going to check our chat room and see if anyone has written any questions. I don't see any. Uh, could some of you quick, here we go. Uh, how do home churches deal with children? And the rest of you, please uh, write some uh, questions in the chat box. We, uh, that was one of our biggest challenges in starting with this. <clears throat> we made a decision that we wanted to do a multi-generational model that kids should be involved. So we involve kids in the worship at the beginning. And um, I, I know uh, the One House Church I was at for a while with Bill and Lori. Uh, we had about five or six kids dancing in the middle during worship. And uh, at one point, I had to say to everybody, don't you love to have the kids dancing? When everybody realized that was okay, we just all started worshiping the Lord even more. Um, we do have a component in our uh, video that we put out. It's uh, a kids ministry thing that we do. So the adults do a Bible memory verse each week with the kids. And then we have worksheets that we hand out to the kids and some of the um, house churches, they just sit at a table, either, either in another room or in the same room. And uh, before we leave that day, the kids come and they show us what they did in their activity sheet and what they learned that day. And uh, the kids are even part of the prayer ministry at the end. So we try to keep them uh, engaged at every level. Is it, is it challenging at times? Yeah, when kids get fussy, it's challenging. We talked to one house church ministry that um, they have kids go, uh, people go through a parenting class before you're allowed to come to house church. Well, we don't do that. We're open to everybody, but we, uh, we do have to address some, some discipleship issues and how to discipline children at times. I hope that helps. Uh, is there anything about your house church movement that is different or similar to the micro church movement? I am not sure what the micro church movement is. So I, I don't know if I can answer that. And Steve, if you want to comment on that, I don't know. No, I would not want to take a swing at that. How? Uh, who, 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 hey, Steve, who asked the question? Oh, Jeff? Jeff, Jeff Snyder. Steve, okay. Steve, you're. Um, yes. Sir. Yeah, maybe you, do you want to just weigh in on that? Like, what is the micro church movement? that you're referring to? Well, in, in many ways, I mean, Francis Chan is, is kind of doing a derivative of that as well. And um, in Kansas City, the Kansas City Underground is is uh, the house church movement. And uh, it, in many ways, it's not very similar. We're just calling it house church movement in that they do have a larger gathering during the month. They do have uh, instruction on how to become a facilitator, if you want to call it that, in each of your house churches. So they're not left alone. So I was just curious if uh, if uh, you were familiar with that and in, in what ways they're similar or dissimilar. That's all. No, I'll tell you what, though, Jeff, I'll look into that. I have I have read a lot of Francis Chan stuff 
and uh, need to track with him a little more closely, but um, I'll see what they're doing in Kansas City, but it sounds similar. And having the hybrid events, having the large events is really powerful too. Last Wednesday, we had, we were packed in our fellowship hall. We have more people in house churches than will fit in our building now, which is a good thing. And we have people coming to house churches that won't go to the big meeting because they're still afraid of the institutional church. But it's interesting. Last Wednesday, we brought in, I think, 18 or 19 new members uh, that became part of the church covenant. And then we baptized six new believers. We had a big meal. And I just, I couldn't believe it. I felt, felt like I was in Acts chapter 2022. It was such, such a beautiful time. See people praying for one another. But those big events give balance to the house church events. And I think that might be the micro church concept that I'm hearing from you. So. Uh, how do you handle offerings or donations? Do they go to the mother church? So we uh, during we have an announcement uh, component when we send the worship out after worship. There's a what's happening this week at River of Life announcement, and uh, during that we tell people three ways they can give. Uh, probably fifty or sixty percent of our people give online or through our app. Uh, people drop money off or they'll give it during the live service the first Sunday. Mm -hmm. My treasurer, when we started this, said, all right, Joe, gut check moment. How are we going to do with house churches? After the first year, our giving was up 25%. This last year, we were up, I think, 30, maybe 35% over the year before. I don't know how that works. I, I just am so blessed. And people seem to be, because they're being blessed, they're giving freely. And we don't pressure people to give, but uh, it's amazing how generous people are being. Okay, uh, someone asks, why not meet corporately every Sunday while prioritizing the house church meeting at the same time? You know, we, uh, we tried a couple different ways of doing it. So we had our uh, house church meetings on Sunday night, Monday night, Wednesday, Thursday, different nights. It wasn't until we made the house church meeting Sunday morning uh, that it really shifted people's understanding that this is really what church is. Uh, this is the primary and most important aspect of church. You may disagree with me, but for us, we felt like that was uh, the important thing to do. Um, so we just kind of flipped it around. Uh, we also tried let's all meet together and then break out into small groups. It's not the same as a house church, the hospitality component and the neighborhood attraction and penetration is different when you're in a house church. So one of our house churches, I'm thinking of all the neighbors and kids that have come into our youth group from that one house church. I don't think they ever would have come unless that church was in their neighborhood. Okay, how many people are in a typical house church? Uh, I think our smallest house church right now is about seven and our largest one is about 28 and that is illegal. We need to multiply that house church. <laughs> So, and uh, we have 14 of them right now, although one house church is taking a break, they're on hiatus. Uh, our farthest one east is in Youngstown, actually Boardman, Ohio. So, I mean, it's, it's funny, we're decentralized. And we also have a, a group in Savannah, Georgia, but they're doing, uh, I think they're doing like three freedom groups this year. They're doing a totally, we call what they're doing unchurched. They're doing a slightly different model but they're still under our covering and it's fun to watch what they're doing. Um, but so that's the size, different sizes. Okay. Thanks. Do you meet <laughs> weekly with your house church leaders? That's a good question. We don't, we uh, meet once a month. So when we have our big all together service, we have a big lunch afterwards. Uh, we usually have about 55, 60 people that are house church leaders and hosts that come together for that. Uh, we do ongoing training, prayer ministry with one another. We discuss issues and challenges. Uh, we are also develop, developing as we grow zone leaders. These are people that will work with house churches in a certain part of the city or a certain zone of the city. And um, so we, we're trying to keep in contact with our house churches. We probably do a call at least once a week and stay in touch with our house church leaders. But the, the meeting once a month is our key meeting. Uh, this July, we're doing a uh, two-day retreat down in um, Berlin, uh, in Amish country, and that has been a key, too. That was one of the best events we ever did in our 25-year history. Uh, last year, we did a retreat, and our church paid for all the house church leaders to go there and attend, and they said, 
pastor, why are you paying our way? And I said, you're our pastors now. And uh, we want to take good care of you. We've totally reallocated even how we invest in leadership and spend our money. So, Okay, good. What happens whenever new people show up on a Sunday morning when no one is there? Show up to the church building on a Sunday morning when no one's there. That's a really good question. So we have uh, two house churches that meet in our building on Sunday morning. And the reason why we kept them going is because they're uh, handicap accessible. So uh, for people that need wheelchair access, uh, some of our seniors that needed to be on a ramp system to get into the building, um, it works out well. So there's always a group here on Sunday morning. So when people show up, they can experience their first house church meeting in our building. Uh, the other thing is we have a, a, a thing called OnRamp where we, and it's online uh, on our website, you can find the uh, four OnRamp videos that explain how to get oriented and how to find a house church. Um, but if people want to join a house church, there's a form they fill out and then we contact them and uh, we will uh, find the house church that's closest to them. Now, let me give you a caveat here. We protect our house church leaders and we don't just say anybody can show up anywhere. If they are invited by somebody in the house church, we assume these are people that are good people that have been vetted, they're being invited. And the people that invite them know who they are. If they're coming out of nowhere, and we've had to actually close the door on a few people that have wanted to come to a house church. I had one guy, he disagreed with me in five points of theology. Uh, he said, I don't believe in the Trinity. I don't believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. He went down the whole list. And they said, but we want to be part of a house church. And I said, no, that's not fair to you. And it's not fair to our house church. So we do some screening with people that just come out of nowhere. And um, we ask them to be part of our on-ramp and get to know them a little bit before we assign them to a house church. Okay, kind of in a similar vein, what is the approval or training process for starting a new house church? And kind of com combined with that, how do you protect uh, from theological drift? But the first question, how are you training the new leaders? Well, I'll tell you, that's interesting. During COVID, if you had a house, you could be a house church leader. No, it wasn't quite that bad. <laughs> you had to be a, a faithful member. But um, right now, most of our training happens on site. So we are constantly asking our leaders to raise up leaders within. So they've gone through our membership uh, training. They've been through our freedom class. Uh, they've affirmed our statement of faith. They know what we believe. So that's one of the ways we do that. But we also have about three to four years of training uh, all the way through seminary level training. Uh, this fall, we're starting, I think we have 10 people that are gonna start what is called the essentials class that is seminary level. So we'll train people all the way up to pastoral level. Um, but it starts with things like hearing the voice of God, how to study the Bible, uh, by Gordon Fee and Doug Stewart. I mean, a lot of different classes that we do, how to uh, walk in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we encourage our leaders, if you're a house church leader, every year you should be doing ongoing training uh, in some of our ministry center uh, discipleship activities. All right. Um, I'm just scanning here. And, and Steve, about theological drift, uh, that has been a challenge in the sense that one of the main things that's happened is people want to pull us off on conspiracy theories. And did you vote for Trump or did you vote for this? Uh, that's just about blowing up some of our house churches, to be honest with you. And we tell people, um, you know, we're that's not what we're about. You can talk about that after the house church meeting is over. Uh, but we're, you know, we need to focus on the word and making disciples and obeying what Jesus called us to do. So. Uh, here's a question. Can you share more on your ramp sessions? On yeah, the, the on-ramp idea uh, is, and, and I don't know if... Um, Jeff or Dion, if you want to weigh in on this, because you guys are as involved as I am on this. Uh, but we have four videos that we ask people to watch, and then we will do either a Zoom or a live session with them. Some of our people are doing this with a house church leader, so they can understand 
uh, what it means to be part of River of Life, what we believe, what our vision is, what our core values are, uh, the ways of God that allow us to walk peacefully with one another. Uh, those are all things that we develop during on-ramp in those four weeks, and we give people a chance to interact and ask questions. And uh, that's just a basic overview, but I think it gives people enough direction to know what we're about. Good. Uh, by the way, one of your folks just mentioned that you, Pastor Joe, sends out a message each week along with discussion questions, which helps keep us all on track. Yeah, so even before the video is uploaded for the house church, I will send out a message notes um, by constant contact, and it's got all the, the teaching notes and questions and things that they can do to prepare for Sunday. And uh, we also prepare our house church leaders with communion, uh, things for communion and everything they need. We've also bought all of our house churches sound bars so that worship is a lot more quality. Uh, because in the beginning uh, with COVID, we had some people with really sad TVs that were killing worship. <laughs> I'm just being honest. How did your people adjust to the change? Boy, these are good questions. You need to know that not everybody that was with us was able to walk in this change. So we lost maybe four or five families or households. Uh, during this time, and a couple of them were very angry. They said, this is not what we signed up for when we came to River of Life, but most understood. I, one guy said, my life has been so changed by your church. He said, I just have to be in a traditional church model. He said, we might be back someday, but we can't do this, and I blessed him and sent him out with blessing, um, but yeah, we, we had some uh, people that did, could not go along with us, but at the same time that I saw four or five households leaving, I saw about 20, 25 households coming in. And we had people coming to us saying, I've been wanting to be part of a house church for years and I haven't had the opportunity and I see what you're doing and I sense God calling me. Uh, I had one guy that showed up. He said, I've been watching you online. And uh, he said, uh, I, I would like to join your church. And he said, I want, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and I want to be part of a house church. I've been part of a mega church that doesn't believe in either of those things. Can I join? And I said, certainly, let's do that. And uh, he has since been filled with the Holy Spirit. He's now one of our house church leaders a couple years later. And God's doing great things in his life. Um, and by the way, we don't put any other churches down. There are so many churches doing so many good things. Uh, even the mega churches. Uh, God has to speak to everybody and show them the way. Uh, I don't think we're God's main event. I just know this is how he's called us to walk. Uh, I've got one more question here, and then Tom Hare, you should be ready to segue into final remarks. Uh, so do you record your worship team, or is it live with your team each week, meaning for these house churches? So Pastor Jeff, are you on? Pastor Jeff is our worship guy. Can you comment on that? Hi, friends. Yeah, I can share real quick. Let's see, is that, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we pre-record our worship services. And so, um, you know, our, our main heart is to make sure that worship is activated within the house church. So we always say, if there's somebody within the house church that is gifted and can play an instrument or can lead, um, we'll, we'll encourage them to do that, but we know that that's not the way it always works out. Um, and so we pre-record worship and upload it as part of our full service that they can use, um, as well. Um, so if they want to supplement that, and then we also take communion in our house churches too. And so a lot of times we'll pre-record kind of a given direction or a scripture, and then we, we have people, uh, take communion together in their house church as well. Okay, uh, Tom, passing it over to you. And hey, do you want to grab that last question there that popped up? Okay. Is there a way different house churches are able to share with the church at large what God is doing in their midst? How is that facilitated? So if there's things happening within the house church, can the greater church find out about it? You know, that's something that we talked about yesterday in a leadership prayer meeting. We need to do a better job with that. 
uh, what's happening is, well, last November, we saw a move of God. There were about 30 healings. I mean, miracles that were happening that were just astounding. And uh, the exciting thing is many of those people that were praying for other people had never had God use them in laying on of hands. I, I almost felt like the Lord was saying, I want to give this away. And uh, sometimes I thought, how do I get the excitement that I'm hearing from individual people to the rest of the church? So we're working on that. Testimonies on the All Together Sunday is one way that happens. Uh, but that's something we're working at, at trying to get the whole church together to understand the wonderful things that are happening. And, and a lot of our people in house churches have gone out there leading their own discipleship groups now. I'm talking to one lady. She's meeting with a whole group of Brazilians in a you know, Portuguese-based language group. Uh, there are so many things happening that I can't keep up with it. And the good news is I'm not responsible for it. God is responsible. He's making it happen. And I'm just sitting back saying, Lord, I've never seen anything like this. And it's fun. Amen. Well, thanks, Joe. That's uh, that's a, a great report. I think you've uh, tried to condense a lot of things here into a little bitty short time. And um, um, I appreciated your caveats at, at the beginning. Um, and and uh, on behalf of yourself, as well as Harvest Net, we're not saying like, this is the way walking in it, but uh, rather kind of like the disciples were walking with Jesus when the one asked him, what about what, what about this guy's doing? And Jesus said, what's that to you? You do what I tell you to do. And, um, and there are many different things that God is doing in the earth, and he gives different people different gifts to be able to facilitate things. And so um, this is this is. This is though one of the things that God is doing very clearly. You know, I think we all know the story of Francis Chan from the, you know, a mega church later to what he's doing now. So um, all of us are on a, on a journey. We're trying to follow Jesus as close as we can. And especially as leaders, we're trying to learn from him how to be more effective leaders and to uh, go about the business of what he challenged us to do, which was to make disciples of, of all nations. and. Um, I'm thankful that the, you know, I, in the midst of whatever pain we've experienced or are experiencing in our culture and through COVID and all that kind of thing, I, I, I really believe what Joe said is right too, that um, we have to guard our hearts uh, concerning the things going on around about us and swirling because it can be easy for people to get discouraged by news, even the reports from Arizona Christian University with um, Perhaps we're witnessing, you know, the, the collapse of church culture of a sort in, in the West. But as history shows us, hist history's on God's side, right? And the church has expanded more than ever now. Um, we're seeing more Muslims have come to the Lord in the last uh, couple decades than in previous centuries. I mean, the Lord is really moving. And uh, so um, thanks for sharing your experience of what uh, is happening there at River of Life. We'll be continuing to pursue this kind of thing. I know there are others on the call that uh, are looking at uh, some things too, um, uh, looking at new approaches and all of that. Let me ask you this, uh, Joe, uh, if someone wants to just talk with you more about this, contact you, um, can you put up in the chat feature there or you know, just who to contact? Should that be you or Jeff or Dion or how do, how, how do you want to do that? Uh, I will put my uh, email and we can uh, decide who can respond. Um, and we are better equipped to do that because of some of the videos that we have. So we can even share some of the videos and uh, that'll probably answer a lot of questions. So there's okay. my email. That, that'd be great. And um, <clears throat> if anybody contacts me, you know, about anything, I'll just forward them on to you. Okay. And uh, so it uh, is one o'clock, which is sort of our official ending time. So any of you that uh, want to go ahead and be re released to go, if uh, those of you uh, who are here want to stay on for a little more conversation, I'd like you to feel free to do that. Uh, I see Pastor LeBoy on there. I know he's been trying to do a thing, Joe, that sounds similar to what you're, you're doing. It'd be good to hear from you. Um, also, we have, uh, if he's still on, Adnan. Uh, are you still there, Adnan, from um, Germany? 
And um, they have done something like this uh, and uh, for a number of years. And um, it's uh, well, Steve and I and others of you perhaps have ministered over in Europe. And uh, it's pretty tough ground over there. And, and they've seen the Lord do some some amazing things. So it, it, I can't see everybody on here. Is, is Adnan still on here? Speak up he is, if you want. No, he's not. He got off. Okay. Well, we lost him. All right. So um, um, if anybody needs to go, feel free. The Lord bless you. Uh, we'll have another Sharpen the Axe coming up in about two months, probably. Um, um, Pastor um, uh, Jesus LaBoy, are you still here? Yeah, there you are. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm well, why don't you tell us just for a minute or two what you guys are trying to press into, if you could. Well, I, I unfortunately, I, I just kept getting off and on because of my, probably my internet. Uh, and I heard some of what the speaker was saying. Um, it, it's very similar to of what we're trying to do right now here in Cleveland. Um, we have always done the small groups for the last 32 years in the ministry that I started 32 years ago. And, and we always run into the same problems. Uh, the problems that we kind of run into is that when the, somehow the, if, the, if the leader has charisma, the group will grow past 15, 30. And then when you split it, when you multiply it, no matter what you call it, People get frustrated. They don't tell you. They will not do anything. But it just seems to fall apart after the after the multiplication. Um, so what, what I'm what we what, what I found through um, through the ministry in California is uh, is is a is the, the ministry of Larry Osborne in California. It's called the Sticky Church talks about all those problems that small groups face. And he, he was basically talking to me because, I, because what we have been doing here in Cleveland is exactly facing all those obstacles. Uh, the group grows nicely, you multiply it, and people get really fed up, frustrated because it's two, three things or four things that are happening in the group. The first thing that is happening is based on the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 42, is that people were getting together to fellowship. So the strong bond was growing in the group. But then when you tell, listen, you guys got to multiply, basically divide, and, and form a new group, um, those bonds that happened during that, that, that period uh, basically break up and people... People just don't continue the same kind of fellowship that they had before because they're a different group now. And, and it's frustrating for people to uh, start a new thing that where they're trying to fellowship and, um, and grow a strong friendship with people. And then for the pastor to tell them, hey, you guys reach the quota, so you guys got to multiply. Um, so it didn't work for us. It's just we try it. For, we we have been doing it for thirty two years, and it just has always been the same. Always the same wall. People, the group grow if the leader has charisma. The leader will the, the group will grow, and then it will when you multiply, it will die out. Um, so sticky church, sticky church, not stinky, but sticky church. By Larry Osborne is uh, is is an, is a good book to read and 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 get some more knowledge about about the small groups uh, uh, that we started here in Cleveland based on the model that they offer in the book and, and it's, it's growing it's definitely growing so book of Acts chap, uh, chapter 2 verse 42 we're getting together for fellowship we're getting together to get into the word or, or, or receive the word that the apostles were teaching and they were breaking bread and there were what was the other thing that they were doing it was prayers prayers yeah so it was four things that do happen in the small group that is uh that is a key verse it, that's that's what happened in, in, in the group mm -hmm. but it's kind of heartbreaking when you uh have families that have been able to bond together for six months a year or whatever 
And I also read a lot of different books. Mm -hmm. uh, that, okay. that, that model was based on the All Young Cho group in South, uh, South Korea, where people live a different kind of society and different kind of system. Like I was telling Tom in, in South Korea, if people are not meeting the quota, they will send them on a retreat to the mountain for a week. Here, if, if I, as a pastor, send people to a mountain on a retreat, they will probably flush me down the toilet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole different system. Okay, the whole it is a system. different culture, yeah. Yeah, it's a whole different culture, the whole different system. Uh, this is not a military culture or leadership culture. This is very independent. Uh, we have a hard time keeping people in the church. People just seem to, we have more church hoppers than we have church commit, people committed to the church. And that's the reality of the, of, of the yeah. population today in the United States. So anyway, the Sticky Church, Larry Oxford. Sticky Church, okay. Sticky church was, uh, All right. was a very good read. All right. Read. So Joe, uh, have you had any, uh, the point that he's, uh, brought up concerning you know people not wanting to divide and then things kind of losing energy have you had any experience well let me back up with one question joe how long have you guys been doing your new rhythm of church oh boy it's been what two two and a half years okay doing this so, so we have multiplied we don't use the word split we use the word multiply. <laughs> or divide <laughs> or divide <laughs> and i'm sure hey zeus you've heard that but um, we, we, that's always a scary thing for people. One of the things we've encouraged people is that it's not the end, it's the beginning of something new. And every time a house church multiplies, the, the potential to reach new people is, is amazing. But we've also told the house churches, once you multiply, you need to then f do zone meetings with the previous house church. Oh. So we would do special meals where a Sunday they would get the two house churches together uh, and have a big meal. And uh, also to lay hands and pray together. Uh, Dion, who's up there on the screen, and Dion, you might want to weigh in on this. I know his house church multiplied recently. It was one of the most beautiful meetings. And of course, it was like wall to wall people. You could see why they needed to multiply. He had, what, almost 30 people there that day. We were at 28 people, and if, if it's okay, I can share the quick walk down. Yeah, do it. Happen. Do it. All right, so we, we grew to about, we started out with about six people. We grew to about 28. Um, in the process, we don't believe that there should ever be a single leader, so we're always constantly looking for multiple leaders so that people, the primary leader should be able to not be there on Sunday and everything still be fine. So we're constantly trying to raise up leaders and raise up more hosts. Um, it got to the point where we just had too many people. And what actually happened is two different people in our house church came up to me within the same two to three day period and said, it's probably time for us to multiply. And that's when I started to say, okay, Lord, where are you leading us in this? So we like to use the phrase speed of relationship instead of a factory. We're trying to grow organically. So we have some structure for things to grow up on, but we really want to just let the Holy Spirit grow things, which means we have to be a little bit more patient. So when I had two different people from my house church say, we're getting really cramped. I said, all right, that's my cue to start praying about who the Lord's raising up. So we started having side conversations with our secondary. Um, and we actually wound up meeting with our secondary leaders for four hours, praying and seeking the Lord for how he wanted the church to be multiplied. And by the time we came to a conclusion of it all, we prayed, we felt it was good with us in the spirit. And then we started bringing that conversation up with the sec with the leaders that we wanted to raise up for the next group that we'd already been pouring into. And we're like, hey, this is where we're going. So we had about a month and a half conversation beforehand. And then we announced it. We told people where they were going one Sunday, the next Sunday, and then all these conversations had already happened. People were already well aware of this stuff. Um, and then we had one Sunday where we announced it. The next Sunday, we all prayed for each other. We broke off into our different groups and each different group prayed for each other and spoke blessing and prophecy. And we, we grounded it over the whole, whole last two months of like, this is health. We are growing. Like the reason we gather together, we're not going to stop seeing each other. And the great thing of the hybrid model is we're able to see each other every month. I still meet with the majority of my old house church because um, we're friends. Um, so that's great. But we, we 
put down as the goals. Like we don't gather together because we like each other. We gather together because we love Jesus. We're multiplying, not because we are out of room, but because more people need Jesus. And so we made the main goal, the main goal, and we sold it on that. And people got a hold of it. We grieved together. We prayed together. And then we multiplied and God's going to do something new in those groups. And we trust that he's going to keep his church going because we're bought into okay, Lord, you're doing something here. We're bought into you. And we understand that we sometimes are going to see people, sometimes we're not. And that's okay, because I want to go where the Lord is leading. And that's really what's been undergirding uh, our multiplication. Uh, just, that's great. Just a quick uh, interjection here. Uh, there was a uh, book that came out, I believe it was the 90s, Joel Kamiski. It was the G12 model. And this came out of Bogota, Colombia, addressing... Uh, Yesus, your very question about, boy, if you're multiplied, divided, you've got human beings that have been together and then split. So what they did, you've got your permanent group of 12 that never goes away. But each one of the 12 goes out and they start another group of 12. And that never goes away. But that group of 12, then they have their group. So you're going to be involved in two small groups of 12 every week. I mean, that's what they did. And of course, that has its downside. Is everybody going to go out? and form a group of 12 and multi-level marketing on paper always works perfectly. <laughs> you know, Steve, uh, but, but there's always this, there's always this human dynamic that, that challenges these things, but we are, but we are trying to lean into, we don't just throw up our hands. We're trying to lean into life, organic growth, etc. So. Man. Yeah. Joe. I was going to say, Steve, you know, we, we looked at the G12 model and then I was down in Argentina and I looked at the model down there and they did the whole zone model. I mean, it was amazing. And I realized that culture is not up here. Right. It wasn't yeah. going to work. Yeah. But what I am seeing out of our house churches is people are getting a vision for discipleship. So one of our house churches, uh, we have a guy that's 82 years old and he now has a group of 10 guys that he's discipling that are not part of the house church. And we're That's seeing awesome. people s spring out. Uh, and he, this guy said, you know, when he was a kid, he was an A.W. Tozer's church. He had an A.W. Tozer's notes. I mean, he, this guy <laughs> had so much to give. And I said, what are you doing wow. now discipling people? So he is now discipling. He's got three guys that aren't in a church anywhere that have joined this group. I don't know if they'll be in one of our house churches, but it's one of those things where people start getting the picture of what can happen and the model can be duplicated, and it's exciting. Oh, that's that's a great report. Well, hey, I see one other question here. Uh, this is um, um, to uh, you, Joe, and also Jesus. Um, approximately, how long are the fellowship time in your house churches or small group thing? So, Jesus, why don't you go first? Um, we tried to keep it within an hour and fifteen minutes. Well, you mean um, for the whole thing? But for the whole thing, right? Right. And we try. And one of the things we do try to avoid is the church building. We want the church out of the church building. <laughs> so uh, the meeting is different, different in a home mm -hmm. than it is in the church church building. So right. we, we it takes about, it takes about an hour and 20, uh, 15 minutes. Sometimes it might take an hour and a half. But we start when people are coming in. We start with the drink. People like to hide behind the cup. You know. And uh, small talk for 10 minutes or so. Now, what kind of drink is that, Jesus? Oh, Puerto Rican drink is very strong. <laughs> nah, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. No alcohol, no, no alcohol, just coffee. Um, so No tequila, right? No tequila, no tequila there. And then we... Um, we, um, we, we, start, we, we started the meeting... Also, kind of informal, without prayers or without praying to start anything. Like that. We just sit around in, like in a circle, and we start, we start asking the leaders start asking questions. How was your week? You know, things like that. And then we usually open it, open it up with a question on getting to know you. So, like, you know, how was uh, your relationship with your father when you were young? Things like a bunch of hundreds of questions that you could ask to get to know a person. And then we, we, we incorporate the teaching based on the sermon for the Sunday uh, on, that, uh, on whatever, whatever the subject is coming up. 
And we, we only ask questions. We are moderators, we're not teachers. The leader is a moderator. So we asked about four or five questions. You know, how did the title of the message touch you or how did the verse impact your life? Things like that. And then we just ended with, with prayer, you know, we uh, in the beginning when we asking people how 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 are they doing, we start gathering the the points of what we're going to be praying about. At the end, we pray for them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we end up with a prayer, and then the snack. We we also have another snack, like uh, anything that we that we provide, like anything, any kind of snacks. And people usually meal around, and within you know 20, 15 minutes. Twenty minutes, people are people are starting to leave. Um, what it does, what it's doing, is is really creating a, a strong bond amongst the brothers. Yeah. Doing okay. That. So Great. it's a health. It's a healthy group. Okay, Joe. Uh, how, how is that similar, or different uh, from what you guys are doing? Well, we encourage people to usually stay within a two-hour uh, period, and some uh, will finish before that. But a lot of our house churches have decided, and they each make their own decision, to have a meal afterwards. And certainly, there's a point where if people need to go, they're released. But I would say Dion, who shared a few minutes ago, he told me their last Sunday was four hours. Uh, they had a big meal, and people wanted to stay, and they had a party in the backyard. The weather was nice. And uh, Jeff and uh, Bree, uh, Jeff's still on if you want to comment, Jeff, but Jeff and Brianne and their house church has done a uh, simple meal. Jeff, I don't know if you want to share how that's worked for you. Yeah. Um, so our formal meeting time is usually about two hours. Um, the recorded, like what, what's actually released, the content that released is almost always less than an hour, about an hour, which leaves lots of time for fellowship and prayer and discussion out of that. By the time we get to the end of our meeting, we do a formal close. Um, but then we kind of have an optional extra for people to stay. We never want people to feel like, oh man, if I invite somebody to church, they have to stay for five hours. That's a big ask. So we kind of formally close and then we invite people to stay for a meal. And we've, we've often had people stay the whole afternoon, just hanging out and building fellowship because that's our, that's our family. It's our friends, you know? So it's not a, not a burden at all. It winds up just being fun. So yeah, um, that's how, that's how it works for us. Okay, great. Well, listen, folks, um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up here. And um, special thanks to, uh, to you, Joe, for um, having put these things together. And um, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> ask, uh, well, Sam, I didn't see you earlier. Nice to have you all the way from California. God bless you, brother. Why don't you close us out in prayer? Would you do that for us? Sure. Uh, well, thank you, Lord, for this uh, time we have together as, as ministers and uh, fellow men in the gospel. I just ask that you will uh, help us to be more effective, innovating and innovating, and uh, just really allow your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us, Lord. There's so much so much changing, Lord, so many different uh, aspects are coming into people's lives and be able to navigate how to reach our community can be, uh, and it is really a, a total lean on the direction and guidance of, of the Holy Spirit. And I just pray that every person will sense the hand of God on their lives and be able to uh, reach out for this uh, a wonderful harvest that you have placed us into Mm -hmm. And uh, and I just it's it's such an honor to be able to uh, be in a harvest and fishers of men. Lord, we just pray your blessing on this meeting in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, everybody. God bless you all. Thanks so much for being together, and uh, thanks Steve for being the Zoom Meister today. Appreciate that. And we'll uh, we'll be in touch by email or some other means. Okay. God bless everybody. Thank you.